If you've been on my channel before, you'll know that I care a lot about performance. So today I want to give some practical tips for writing fast code. And we'll do that by solving day 19 of last year's advent of code. The initial solution will take more than 2 minutes to complete, and the final optimized version will run in just under 3 milliseconds, so a bit faster. But the interesting part is we won't be using any techniques that you might typically associate with optimization. So there won't be any multi-threading, no SIMD, we won't be messing with memory layout or data dependencies. We'll do all of this optimization by simply doing less. You see, if you're driving somewhere and you want to arrive quicker, there are two things you can do. First of all, you could drive faster. Or second of all, you could try to find a better route. In other words, shortening the distance that you have to travel. And once you've done that, you can still drive faster to arrive even quicker. And in programming, driving faster is about using techniques like multithreading and so on. These are about doing the same amount of work just in less time by using the hardware in a more efficient way. And reducing the distance would be about doing less work. So for example, we could use more efficient data structures and algorithms. So for example, swapping a linear search for a binary search, or maybe we can swap out some kind of hash map for an array. The next thing we can do is we can use more domain knowledge, so making more assumptions about our problem. We'll be doing a lot of that today. And another thing we could do is we could maybe relax the requirements a little. Maybe we don't actually need an entire list of all of our employees ordered by how much code they write, Maybe we only need the bottom 50 of those, because those are who we're going to fire, of course. And if we only need the bottom 50 of a sorted list, we might be able to use a more efficient algorithm. So tip number one, first try doing less. And this may seem kind of obvious, but trust me, even experienced developers make this mistake from time to time. And we'll see various examples of what it can mean to do less throughout this video. But for now, let's get started with the problem description. So the problem is about a kind of turn-based game where we have resources, or clay, obsidian, and geodes, and our goal is to maximize the number of geodes that we have after a given number of turns. And the way that we get more resources is through robots. Each robot that we have produces one of its corresponding resource on each turn. And we start out with exactly one ore mining robot, so we kind of have to work our way up from there. And the way that we get more robots is that on each turn we have the option to trade some of our resources to build one robot. The price of each robot is given by a blueprint. We also have various blueprints, and our goal is to find, for each one of them, the maximum number of geodes we can get after a given number of turns. So in summary, we have robots which produce resources, and we can trade resources for more robots. And the goal is to maximize the number of geodes. So how might we go about solving this? Well, first of all, we'll probably want to model our data. So we have the blueprints, which have an ID and the cost of each robot. We need a function to parse them, but we'll skip that for brevity. We'll also want to model our state. We need to know which minute or turn we're on, how many robots, and how many resources we have. For convenience, I've also made some helpers to check whether we can build a certain kind of robot, and then do that if we have the resources. All right, we're trying to write fast code, so let's try to come up with an efficient strategy. We may observe that the geode robot is definitely the best thing that we can build, because that directly contributes to the number of geodes that we have, which is what we want to maximize. So first, we should try to build the geode robot. And if we can't do that, we might build an obsidian robot, because those will help us to build more geode robots in the future. Similarly, we might argue that the next priority are clay robots and ore robots, because those help us to build the other robots. And then we might repeat this strategy until we've reached the time limit. So in the code it would look something like this. We create the state with only one ore robot and no resources, and then for the number of turns that we have, we apply our strategy. And at the end, we return the number of geodes that we have. The only problem is, that this sadly doesn't work. What we've used here is what's called a greedy strategy, or a greedy algorithm. It always builds the best kind of robot that it can. But the problem with that is it doesn't really account for future actions. So maybe right now we can't build a geode robot, but we could build an ore robot, for example. But that might prevent us from building a geode robot on the next turn. So tip number two, even when writing fast code, always start out with an algorithm that is definitely correct. Because even if it's too slow, we can still try to optimize it. Whereas an algorithm that's not correct, it doesn't really matter how fast it is, because it doesn't give us the right answer. So as an exercise, if you haven't solved this problem yet, try to come up with an algorithm that is definitely going to be correct, even if it may be way too slow. Alright, something we can always try when it comes to these kinds of decision problems, I suppose, is we can always try brute force. Just try all of the options that there are, even if that may be way too slow. So here's an example. Let's say this is our blueprint with the costs of each robot, and this is our initial state with the robots on the left and the resources on the right. Now on the first turn we have no resources, so we can't build any robots, meaning we have to wait. 
but we get an all resource, though we still can't build a robot, which means we have to wait another turn. Now in turn three, we could obviously wait again to get another resource, or we could observe that we have two ore, so we can now build a clay robot. And if we continue with the strategy of trying all the possible moves, we end up with a tree that looks something like this. So an algorithm that's definitely going to be correct is one that traverses this tree starting at the root, going all the way down until it hits the turn limit, and on the way up returns the maximum number of geodes. And in the code, this actually looks quite similar to the greedy strategy, although instead of a loop, we're using recursion, and instead of trying only one of the options, we try all of them, and then return the maximum. But again, we have a problem, which is that I let this run for a couple of minutes, but it just didn't really terminate. But maybe you can think of some kind of generic optimization that we could try here. The idea would be to reduce the amount of work that's being done without changing the actual strategy, so we still want to try all of the possible options. All right, when it comes to these kinds of recursive problems, it can often be a good idea to try to reuse some work. So we're of course dealing with a pure function here, in other words, the result, the number of geodes, depends only on the inputs of the function. And of these inputs, only the state actually changes across the recursive calls. So what we can try to do is to cache some results. To do that, we'll just add another parameter to the function, a hash map from states to u32s, so similar to the function signature. And when we do that, we actually get an execution time of 140 seconds. So yay, we got a result. Although not so yay, because that's over two minutes. So tip number three, use caches to avoid doing expensive work multiple times. But you may be wondering how much work is this cache actually doing for us? because we don't have a baseline execution time, so we don't know whether two minutes is good or bad. And I asked myself the same question, so I gathered some statistics. I got a variable that counts each time the cache is referenced, and one that counts each time the cache is hit. And the results were a bit surprising to me. There were about 800 million lookups into the cache, and because we're doing one cache lookup on each call, this is actually also the number of states that we actually visited. But we only had about 400 million cache hits, which is less than 50%, and that seemed a bit low to me. So I asked myself, does this mean that the cache only results in about a 2x speedup, and the brute force version would have executed in about five minutes? And if not, then what does this cache hit rate even mean, and why is it so seemingly low? And you can of course pause the video and think about this for yourself. All right, as you've probably guessed, no, the cache does not only result in a 2x speedup. It is a lot more than that. And the reason for that is something akin to survivorship bias. Because you see, if we have a cache hit high up in the tree, that actually means we skip out on a lot of nodes. So in this case, our stats will tell us that we had nine cache references because we visited nine nodes, but only one cache hit, which would be 11%. But like in survivorship bias, this isn't really telling us the whole truth because without the cache, we would have visited 15 states. So our effective cache hit rate, if you will, is actually about 60%. And if we do the same kind of accounting in the actual problem, then we get a 99.8 cache effectiveness. So without the cache, the brute force version would have run in about five hours. So I'd say the cache is quite effective. And this perhaps somewhat surprising effectiveness of caches in recursive problems is really the core idea behind dynamic programming. So if you're struggling to understand dynamic programming, just think of it as recursion plus caching. All right, let's start applying some domain knowledge. It may not surprise you to hear that more time is better than less time. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, let's say we encounter a state xyz somewhere down in the tree, but we've actually already encountered xyz somewhere earlier. Now, when I say we encounter the same state, I mean the same number of resources, the same number of robots, but a different turn number. Then I argue if that is the case, we don't actually have to visit this subtree, so we can skip it, as if we had a cache hit, even though we don't have a cache hit because the minute or the turn number is different. But why would that be the case? Well, again, intuitively, it is because we have more time left so we can produce more resources. But we can also think about it this way. The states that we would have visited, we have actually already visited in the other subtree, because our logic that decides which states to visit doesn't actually depend on how much time is remaining. And that means the result for this larger subtree will be greater than or equal to the result of this smaller subtree. And because we only care about the max across the entire tree, we can actually treat these states as equivalent. So in the code, we now have to separate the state into a minute and the resources. I think they were called pack in the problem description. And in the function, we change the hash map key to the pack, so the resources and robots we have. And in the result, we also store the minute at which this result was recorded. And in the implementation, we use the state's pack to look up into the memo table. 
And then if the state's minute is greater than or equal to the cached minute, we can just return the result. And doing that halves our execution time down to 70 seconds. So that's pretty good. Although we of course still have a long ways to go to get down to the millisecond range. But before we'll get to the optimizations with the more crazy gains, let's first do some more generic optimizations that you might even be able to apply directly to your code. And the first thing we'll do is we'll switch from 32-bit integers down to 8-bit integers. Just this change alone reduces the execution time down to 59 seconds, so another about 15% gain. But why would that be? Well, I'd say there are two primary factors here. First of all, we're using less memory, so more of the hash map could fit into the CPU cache for example, and in general we're copying less memory around, though I actually haven't tested this hypothesis. What's definitely going on though is that we have less hashing overhead, because whenever we make a lookup into the hash map or insert an item, we of course have to hash all of these values. And because hash functions by design are sequential computations, the more bytes we have to process, the longer it takes. And I actually benchmarked how long it takes to hash these structs, and the one at the bottom is about 10% faster. But the reason I made this change was actually not to get a speed up. To understand what I was trying to do here, we'll have to look at the implementation of the hash function for this struct. And that looks something like this. We basically feed all of the fields of the struct one by one to the hash function. And that's not good. The reason that's not good is because the hash function used on my system is a 64-bit version of zip hash, and that means in order to process the hash it actually first needs 8 bytes of data. But we're of course just giving it one byte at a time, and in order to support that the hash function actually first has to check if the number of bytes it was given is not a multiple of 8, and if so the remainder first have to be put into an internal buffer. So basically we put all of these bytes into the buffer one by one, and when that's done the hash is computed. And all of that is of course completely redundant work, because these 8 bytes are already sequential in memory, so the hash function could just read them all at once as a 64-bit value and be done. But because we're feeding the bytes one by one, we get a lot of overhead here. So here's what we can do. First, we'll switch the hash map key to a U64, and then we'll just reinterpret the pack as a 64-bit value, using an unsafe transmute. And when we do that, we actually get an execution time of 44 seconds, so quite a significant speedup. Maybe not in the context of this video, but in a more real-world example where you have some kind of hot hash map, this could actually be quite a significant optimization. Although I should of course address the elephant in the room, which is his unsafe transmute, because some people are of course unreasonably offended by unsafe. So I'll just show you how to do this in safe Rust as well. Basically what we do is we use U64 from native endian bytes, and then put all of the bytes in there, one after the other. And if all of these bytes are sequential in memory, the optimizer can just turn this into a single memory read. But for that to be the case, we have to use the repc attribute on the struct, because of course in Rust, field layout is undefined by default. Now, you can of course decide which one of these you like better, but I definitely prefer the unsafe transmute. Not only because it's shorter and we only have to change one area in the code, but also because it's actually a little more robust. You see, when we add another field to the struct, for example another u8, increasing the size to 9 bytes, then the transmute would raise an error, because it requires that the source and target type have the same size, but in this case, because we've listed out all of the fields, we'd actually get a silent failure, because of course this U64 is supposed to represent the entire struct. Anyway, tip number 5, use bigger hash map keys. Although, I'd say there's actually a more important takeaway here, which is, understand how the abstractions that you use work, so you can use them effectively. And this is actually a really really important technique when it comes to doing less work, and I'll probably have to do another video just on this point, because it's so important. Okay, things are about to get a little crazy. These next couple of optimizations will take us all the way down from 44 seconds down to 24 milliseconds, so almost 2000 times faster. And all of these optimizations will be about only one thing, and that is reducing the number of states that we explore. If you remember, the full decision tree had about 400 billion nodes, and we've already reduced that to about 500 million with the current version but there are still quite a few bad strategies in this tree. For example, check out this left branch here. It always waits until it can build a clay robot, and then waits, and builds another clay robot, and so on. All it does is build clay robots. Or this one on the right here. It always waits, 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 waits. Both of these strategies never result in any geodes being produced, so ideally we'd want to detect that and stop exploring these kinds of states. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to keep track of the maximum number of geodes across all states that have already reached the turn limit. And then if it's impossible for the current state, with the time that's remaining, to beat this maximum number of geodes, we'll just early out from the function. But how can we determine whether a given state with a certain time limit can still beat a maximum number of geodes? 
Well, the idea is to compute an upper bound on how many geodes this state could possibly still produce. And then if the current number of geodes plus this maximum upper bound is less than or equal to the current maximum, then we know we don't need to explore this state. And to compute this upper bound, we first compute how much time is left and then multiply that by the current number of geode robots. So this is how many geodes we'd still get if we didn't build any more robots. But we also need to account for the possibility of more robots being built in the future. And to do that, we'll assume the best case that one more robot is built on each turn that's still left. So we'll get remaining minus one many geodes for the first robot that's built, remaining minus two for the next, and remaining minus three for the one after that. So we can use the formula for the sum of the first n natural numbers to account for the future robots. And using this optimization, our execution time already goes down to about three seconds. And we now only visit about as many states as there are citizens in Germany. Okay, for the next optimization, let's have a look at the rules again. If you think about the implications of this first and this last rule, we can actually come up with a pretty decent optimization. You'll note that each of our robots produces one of their corresponding resources on each turn, and we can only build up to one robot on each turn. This means if we have enough robots to produce enough resources to build the most expensive kind of robot on each turn, then we actually don't need to build any more robots, except for geode robots, of course. So with this blueprint, once we have four ore robots, 14 clay robots, and seven obsidian robots, we shouldn't build any of these robots anymore, because that would just result in resources being built that we don't need, and that don't contribute to our final score. So in the code, if we can build a certain kind of robot, we'll first check if we already have enough of them, and only if we don't do we actually explore the branch where we built this kind of robot. And this optimization again results in almost a 10x speedup. We're now at 417 milliseconds, and only about 12 million states explored. Now, going back to the decision tree, we can actually spot another bad kind of strategy in this diagram. And that is right here. On the third turn, we have the option to build a clay robot or to wait. And if we wait, then we can still build the clay robot. But there's actually no reason to do this. Because if we were going to build the clay robot anyway, we might as well have done it earlier. Because then we get another resource for free, so to speak. And we can see that by looking at the resulting states. Both of these have one ore and one clay robot but one of them has another clay resource, while the other one doesn't. So our next optimization will prevent this kind of behavior, where we can build a robot, but instead wait and waste time, only to then actually build the same kind of robot. To do that, we'll add some more parameters to the function again, which basically tell us whether we're allowed to build certain kinds of robots. And whenever we build some kind of robot, we just pass true, true, true to the function, because this is only about the case where we wait. And here we basically compute whether in the current state we could have built all the kinds of robots, and then if we could, we'll prevent the next state from trying that again. And doing that, we'll get all the way down to 24 milliseconds and about 500,000 states explored. So I think we've done quite a good job here. We went from about 800 million states to about 500,000, and from about two minutes to about 24 milliseconds. But if you remember, I actually said that we were going to get down to about 2.7 milliseconds. So we actually have one more optimization that we'll do. But I think, given these statistics, you might actually be able to figure out what that's going to be. And if not, I can give you a hint. So here's the hint. Of the three optimizations that we just did, the first two cut down the number of states by about a factor of 7, and resulted in about a 13 and an 8 times speedup. But the last optimization we did actually resulted in a 22x decrease in the number of states that we visited, so a lot more. But Relatively speaking, the speedup is actually relatively low. So it seems we're hitting some kind of other bottleneck here. So here's what's going on. Not only has the number of states we visited decreased and the time it takes for us to do that, but there's one more metric which is also declined, and that's our cash hit rate. It started at about 48% and we discussed how that's actually a pretty decent cash hit rate for this kind of recursive problem, but now it's only down to about 5%. And most of that happened during this last optimization. So we're now exploring so few states, and so few of them are duplicates, that our hash map is actually becoming the bottleneck. So this last optimization is simply about removing the hash map. We visit a few more states, but we get another 6x speedup. And we have no cache hit rate, because we no longer have a cache. This last optimization was literally just deleting code. I don't think I could have asked for a better ending to a video about doing less. So with that, thanks for watching. And if you want to watch another video about doing less and how hash maps are slow, go check out Tantan's multi-threaded code review video. I'll see you there.